Welcome to our very first session for Human Health in the Space Environment for 2023. And um, a very special welcome to our guest speaker this morning, Professor John French, who is dialing in from Florida in the USA. I'll just read a brief introduction about Professor French, and then we'll get started with the talk. John French is a tenured professor in the Human Factors and Behavioral Neurobiology Department at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and the Department Research Director. He has over 100 publications in human performance enhancement, particularly during physiological stress and stress countermeasures. He received his MS and PhD in Experimental Physiological Psychology at Colorado State University and postdoctoral training in the Laboratory of Cerebral Metabolism at Cornell University Medical College. He became the director of the preclinical EEG screen or Park Davis Pharmaceutical Company, while also a research associate in the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Michigan. He worked on C141, C5 and B1 and B2 and other pilot performance programs. He was the co-principal investigator for a NASA study of astronaut cognitive effects on the IML2 shuttle mission during his tenure there. Dr. French worked for the next four years in the biomathematical modeling industry after developing a predictive model of human stress, particularly fatigue stress for warfare gaming exercises. He has been with Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University for the past 15 years, where he teaches most of the neurobiology courses. His research areas include colors for next-gen displays, hypoxia behavioral effects, vestibular pharmacology, and vibrotactile cueing. The title of his talk today will be Space Dangers Preventing Human Exploration Beyond Earth. So thank you again very much, John, for coming along today and over to you. Well, thank you very much. I, I like nothing more than talking about space and space research. I think that that's where our future has to be. And it's up to, to this generation of, of people that, that uh, we need to turn uh, to turn the reins over. And it's, it's not to put any pressure on you, but <laughs> we've got to get off this rock as soon as possible. Um, and I'll try to explain why, and then I'll, but I'll also try to explain how dangerous that really is. And hopefully you'll be able to, to come up with the countermeasures that we need uh, in order to, to start to explore space, to habitate, habitat space, to, to be um, uh, the space explorers that we many think we're destined to be. So I'll, I'll go ahead and share my, my screen. This is my contact information. If any of you would like to pursue some of the things that I've talked about um, in, in more detail, I'd be happy to respond. First off, I'd like to talk about <clears throat> NASA proposals that we've had in the works in the past and the present and, and kind of explain my interest in, in space. And uh, let me say at the outset that, that I think that our, our future is, has to be in space, has to be on other planets, um, I don't think that we'll survive here for very much longer. And I'm in good company when I say that. Stephen Hawking, Carl Sagan, many other people have, have expressed the same uh, idea. But I also think that leaving now is, is it's a death sentence. It's, 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 it's just ridiculous to try to, 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 habitat, to habitate Mars and, and the moon without attending to many of these space dangers. So let's, let's begin. First, we'll talk about uh, space dangers that are small, and then we'll talk about those that are extremely large. And then I'll mention some countermeasures that, that I've thought of, and, and hopefully you can extend further. And then we'll have a little bit of questions and answers at the end. I provided this presentation to, um, to um, uh, Rowena so that she'll be able to pass them along to you if you like. Uh, and there's many people as hard as it is for us to believe, because I believe we all have an interest in getting to space that, that don't think we should go into space. It's too expensive. Um, why uh, why do we divide our, we got too many other problems on earth. That's certainly the case, but I think that it's uh, like climate change for instance, but I'm afraid that just like we haven't attended to any other looming catastrophes, um, 
uh, in time, they, they've always seemed to have gone over us, then, then just like with climate change, we're going to really not attend to, to solving that problem. And so we have to get off the earth. If we want the species to be saved, or if we think humanity is, has provided any, any good, uh, any good to the earth, then, then it's time to, to find a, a hearty group of people who are willing to go. <clears throat> Um, and, and I'm of the mind that we should. There, there's, you know, we've been on the earth as hominids for perhaps 200,000 years, uh, which is a drop in the bucket. The dinosaurs were here for 17 million years, and they had a brain the size of a walnut. And so it, 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 maybe we haven't run our course. We're already about to, we have the ability to destroy ourselves many times over. And so maybe a brain isn't such a great idea. It was certainly an experiment of nature. Let's let's try a, a large brain and see if that provided some survival value. And we've occupied every niche in the in the biosphere on the Earth, but uh, apparently not with too much good. By the way, this is um, from uh, the landing spots of all the recent parts, uh, recent rovers and and, and past rovers. Uh, from from the U.S., there's a couple of others from China, but I don't think that they're doing so well. China landed a rover there first last year, and it hasn't produced much information from what I'm told by my resources. But if you saw the movie The Martian, here's where the hab was uh, compared to all the other places. You remember, he drove to the Pathfinder to get get the um, uh, the energy that he needed to to drive him all the way to Chaparelli Crater, which exists. And it's very close to where um, the Curiosity rover is now. Okay, um, I, I mentioned that Carl Sagan is, has often speaks about how we have we feel this draw to, to go to space. This this uh, space compels us to to go and explore uh, because we're star stuff, as he famously says. And Stephen Hawking's made a tremendous prediction. Um, a few years ago before his death, saying that we have at most only a thousand years on the earth left. And about a year before he died, he said that that was about a hundred years. So he, he, it's gotten worse in his opinion. Um, Arthur Clark, a famous novelist and scientist said that there's only two possibilities that we're alone in the universe or we're not. And he felt that both were equally terrifying. I think that's a, a pretty important quote as well. Looks like woman in love. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, you probably weren't born in 1994 or anywhere near it, but um, that's when I had uh, the experiment that um, was mentioned in the introduction uh, on on the International Microgravity Lab. It was IML two, uh, and it was flown because of the specific question that we were asked: is if could would the astronauts be facing any any cognitive loss due to microgravity? And that was the experiment that we set up. But there was so much happening at that particular time in 1994. It was the 25th anniversary of the first moon man moon landings. Um, uh, Shoemaker Levy Nine, the, the string of asteroids was colliding into Jupiter, and that made you know nightly news very exciting, far more exciting than anything else that was on at the time. And, uh, and our experiment, Performance Assessment Workstation, or PAUSE, uh, on that particular um, shuttle mission. By the way, Bob Cabana, who's shown in this picture, went on to become the head of the astronaut corps. He went on to become the, and now he's just, I think, the assistant director at NASA and destined to be di the director one day, I believe. Um, here he's shown using our you know, because it's NASA, you have to spend a lot of money to make a particular trackball. You can't just use a regular old trackball. So we had a $5,000 trackball that would, would withstand um, all the, the damages that, that they expected, fires and, and other things that might happen in the space capsule, and a titanium shelled laptop that um, would probably survive long after the people didn't. Uh, but this is kind of what we found in that experiment, and I, I won't belabor this point. I just wanted to show that uh, we trained people, um, the student population, and their uh, and the astronauts here, uh, shown in the dots. And this was the prediction line as to where the astronauts would be if they were continuing on the training as they 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 had been on the Earth. 
but with launch and with recovery, we saw that there, there seemed to be a microgravity effect in space, but on closer approximation, we found that that was really a fatigue effect, not a microgravity effect on cognitive ability. They were just tired. They'd spent years preparing for this mission. And here, here, here was their first chance to, to do it. And, and they were told to go to sleep at, at, at certain times. It, it was just impossible to sleep for them. In spite of some of the drugs that they were taking to help them sleep, uh, it didn't happen very, very easily. So these, this is a fatigue effect and not a microgravity effect. Um, another proposal that we've got in the loop right now is to try to assist uh, astronauts who might have to take a, a manned landing approach to the moon as, as the Apollo astronauts did. I hope you get a chance to look up on YouTube uh, the video and, and, uh, and audio of the Apollo, most of the Apollo missions, but certainly Apollo 11, Armstrong and, and Aldrin were, um, realized that the, the computers at the time, this is 1968, were going to put them on the lip of a crater and they would have tumbled over and, and crashed, putting the entire um, space program back by decades. And so they decided to push forward and, and, and land a little bit farther beyond. But as a as the rocket motors were, as they got close to the, to the lunar surface, the dust from the lunar surface was kicked up and created this, this uh, directional um, view of, of the of past their little window that they had that, that made it difficult for them to steer a course, a straight course. The, 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 the dust was being blown to the left and you can hear Arms, uh, Aldrin saying, you're drifting too far right, you're drifting too far right. As Aldrin, uh, Armstrong tried to, to, to maneuver the thing past that, that dust that was blowing to the left in his window. And we've come up with a, 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 a vibrating vest, these little red dots or a little tactor, little vibrators that tell you exactly where you are um, in space and, and it helps you keep your course. Uh, if you're drifting too far right, it would, it would show you over here that you were, you were you know, keep buzzing these until you corrected it. And then it would buzz in the center, let you know exactly your position, no matter, you wouldn't have to take your eyes off the window. You could, you could feel your cutaneous sense where you were actually going. So we hope that this proposal will be successful. I think that there's still an opportunity with um, Artemis for uh, emergency human landings. Um, and it's going to take a lot for them. with a few seconds, they have to quickly gather the situational awareness to land that that big pencil that they'll be sticking on the or if if the NASA lander goes and it'll it'll look like this. Um, so we're hoping that we can convince them that this is a good idea. Okay, the smaller but deadlier dangers that we're not talking about engineering dangers here, by the way, that's that's something that we hope can be. Uh, that the engineers will, will take care of. But uh, there, there are an awful lot of things we don't know about human compatibility with space travel or with landing on other planets. So few people have been in space that uh, we're, we're still discovering new, new problems, as we'll talk about later, the uh, choroidal um, uh, enfolding that's happening with the retina of the eye. It's folding up like an accordion in microgravity, and there has to be some solution to that, or there'll be um, a, a very, very bad visual acuity will result. I will talk about these, these next. Um, that's a small problem in space, but one important to all of us is if you can burp in space, you know, with microgravity, the fluid is moved up into the very neck of the esophagus and actually prevents people from burping. There's a lot of gas that, that's built up in the uh, in the stomach. And uh, it is possible to burp, though, it's, although the astronauts report that it's, it's more concentrated with, with gas, well, with the, the hydrochloric acid. Um, so it makes it what they call a wet burp. But it's very, very painful um, in order to get rid of some of the extra gases that are in your gut. So it has to come out the other way where it's less less likely to, um, uh, to to burn. But wet burps are painful, just in case you were wondering. We also have this problem of space anemia. There's a, a fluid loss in um, uh, in space, uh, and, and nobody's exactly sure why. The, the fluid moves towards the head region. It's the cephalid fluid shift. And, and with that, there's a, a loss of, of fluid, about two cc's um, in a standard sample shown here. And then if you spin that down, 
the, the hematocrit level stays about the same. It's 45% of whatever the sample is. So this suggests that since we don't have a, a corresponding loss of uh, red blood cells that we do of, of all the, of the plasma portion, that there's a, there's, it's been reduced as well. There's, a, there's a, um, a space anemia, and this is the result of how that happens. Um, and as you know, that you, you've got to have your, your red blood cells if you want to have the um, oxidative power of, of um, respiration, cellular level, and, and, and pulmonary level. Another problem with getting into space, it's really a small problem, we hope, but we don't know because we've never tried to send more than a few people into space at a time, were some of the biodome experiments. Um, it's, some of them have been going on for a, a long time now, but Biodome 1 was the, the big attempt, the very first attempt to get a large number of people in a, in a perfect environment. Could we build a habitat on the moon and would people work together uh, in a cooperative manner? But it failed miserably, as did Biodome 2. They got even better equipment, better place. This is Biodome 2, by the way. And Jane Pointer wrote the book called two years and 20 minutes that she spent in, in Biodome 2. You can almost feel the anger that she had for all the, the people that she, she was friends with at the very beginning. It, it got into to become a terrible problem for them. And this is under the best of circumstances. They had rainforest um, environments, ocean, river, marshes, deserts, a farm. They could grow their food. Uh, and it was just the, the personality issues, the equipment issues. It was just too much. They couldn't put up with it. NASA is finding the same things in the Biodome 3 that they tried in Hawaii. People are, are cooperating and, and doing well, but, but they're very eager to get out of there. So it's, it's, it's a small problem in that people can do it, but, but uh, it doesn't seem to be something that people want to do, even in the best of circumstances. And we're going to be in a, a very small environment in, in the gateway system uh, that NASA has proposed to send us to, the, to Mars and certainly to orbit the moon. So uh, and it's much smaller and certainly less, far less perfect than Biodome. So that's going to be a problem. Right now, it's it's sort of military. You know, it's run by um, commanders and and sub commanders and so on. And then the the people like the, um, the the crew mission specialists who are at the very lower end of the spectrum, they just follow orders. And that seems to be working. But you wonder how how. What a great, if it's a great experience or not for them. This is Gateway, which is much smaller than Biodome, but it's going to be where they'll be in space for um, orbiting the moon. And, and probably uh, if NASA has their way, although I, I have yet to find anybody who's, who's, who's at NASA who will talk about their plan for Mars. I don't think they have one. They're kind of building it as they go along with, um, uh, with what happens on the moon. Uh, but this is the, the orbiting system that they have. Uh, and you're expected to be able to do exercising, as you can see this gentleman is doing, um, and traveling around, uh, as well as getting into the lunar modules that will be sent to the surface and up on the other side, accepting modules from the Earth. Um, so it's a nice system, but this is Gateway. But it's much smaller than Biodome. Elon Musk has a... Um, the idea that you can send about a hundred people to Mars in a spacecraft like this one, carrying a hundred pe people per flight. And he thinks it would get about nine years before he could get a million people to Mars, which is his goal. And he's also on record as saying that the first couple of people probably would be um, not, you know, we must be willing to accept some sacrifice. He said the same sort of thing about um, uh, automated cars. You know, we have to be willing to accept some level of, of fatalities in order to make this, which would be a much greater good, happen. So he doesn't seem to care too much about the people he's throwing at Mars and hope that some of them will stick. But uh, I'm going to try to explain that it's not likely with current technologies that many people will stick. But it's a grand concept and one I think we all share as to having uh, a Mars city or even a lunar city, we could just get that going. Uh, I'd be happy, but uh, uh, it's a pretty ambitious plan. If you've ever seen his presentation at the uh, SpaceX um, February 10th meeting in 2022, it's really worth watching. It's about an hour of, of what it would be like to land on. Uh, um, I'm sorry, it's only about five minutes. They don't go into much detail about how we get there. They're all 
very pleasant and happy and getting along well, even though it's been an eight month journey in there. Um, they've been exposed to not just solar radiation, galactic radiation, and, and their muscles are so weakened that they would probably have great difficulty opening the door. Those that survived, of course. Um, the, the big issue I think that really befalls um, people going into space is microgravity. Uh, it's shown here that it's a lot of fun at first and we seem to like it with, you know, uh, we have a, a zero G company that sends people for 5,000 bucks into, into parabolic flights that where they can experience gravity and people seem to enjoy it. But it also produces a, 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 a tremendous fatigue a fatigue that's associated with motion sickness. Sometimes the only symptom of motion sickness is this, this great fatigue. It's even given a name called SOPITE. You know, you can ride that roller coaster and think that you, you know, you didn't get sick, so you feel pretty good about it, but you're really tired and you don't know why. The astronauts have periodic bouts of, of motion sickness, but they have chronic fatigue. They're always complaining about their, well, not complaining, astronauts don't really complain, but uh, it, it may be, uh, as we'll talk a little bit more about later, the SOPITE syndrome. Okay. Uh, and as I mentioned, people seem to enjoy it and are willing to spend a lot of money for, this, for the microgravity experience. Although in, in the, the zero G flights, you're also getting hypergravity as you, you climb back up to get to the, uh, the top of the parabola. In the 1950s, the, the Disney, um, actually the engineers at the time, thought that we would be terrified of, of, of microgravity. There might have to be ropes strung around the, the space capsule so that people could, could climb their way around rather than float around it. It would be this constant sense of falling that you might get if you jumped off of a high dive. Imagine that, that feeling going on for hours and hours and hours is how they envisioned it. But if you, you learn to control that, it's more like being in free fall and people seem to enjoy that as well. Oh, because of our vestibular system, this little tiny postage stamp sized organ that sits within our, our inner ear area next to the, to the cochlea. But the, the physical effects of space are, are even persist even after they've come back to the earth. Once you get used to the microgravity effects in space, it's kind of like being on a cruise. You know, you get uh, an ocean cruise, you get used to the, to the, uh, the, the motions of the ship such that you can walk through a, a door um, that's open without bumping into the door because you're not used to the, um, to the motion of the ship. But once you get used to that motion, then you have no trouble in navigating through the doorway until you, you get off on land again. And then you might notice that you've experienced difficulty walking through doors again because you're, you're now expecting the ship's movement. And so you, you can sometimes walk right into a door or faint as this astronaut did. She had difficulty standing and walking upright and she certainly um, lost a lot of balance, but here it's more of a, a vascular problem. I think she had syncope that probably um, uh, caused her to, to faint. Now we all know about um, Scott Kelly's uh, trip to space and he's, he's written this book, which goes into great detail about some of the, the problems that he experienced and it certainly Fatigue which was up there, as was nausea from, from motion sickness um, and, and uh, his bone mass loss. And he even experienced some cognitive effects uh, from long-term space flight. But that is more likely to have been caused by the, the radiation exposure that he got. Compared to his twin brother, Mark Kelly, on the Earth, uh, the, they, they've noticed this. It was a, a very nice study, even though it's an N of two. Um, the, the big problem that for him is the um, his DNA has changed and to, to someone much older. The teleomeres have, have become even more shredded, consistent with somebody um, a lot older than he is. So it's an interesting read, and he goes on about some of the problems that he experienced. Um, all right. So the larger space dangers that we can expect, I've already mentioned, um, radiation and, and microgravity. We have to be able to solve those problems or it's, I believe it's a death sentence to go to Mars. Uh, so the moon's fine. It's, you know, you're not gonna be suffering these dangers for too, too long, only if we do it right though. And the number one danger is radiation, whether it's from the solar, from our sun, or whether it's from suns that have died and, and exploded far away. 
Um, and, and that gives us our galactic cosmic radiation, which is a more serious radiation. Um, and and uh, one that's, they're heavier particles than, you know, iron ions and such rather than the, the helium and hydrogen ions that we're getting from our sun. Uh, but the, during the, um, uh, when they sent up the Curiosity rover, it had one of the best at the time dosimeters on it. And somebody had the great idea, well, let's turn it on and see what kind of exposure we're getting on the flight through space without the Earth's atmosphere, without the magnetic core of the Earth to protect us, how, what's happening in space as we travel to another planet. And when they downloaded the information, it was pretty remarkable that they the, the curiosity had gotten, I'm sorry, the perseverance had gotten something like um, uh, eight months of, uh, after eight months, it had gotten the, the uh, cumulative, something like 80% of the cumulative dose that, that NASA allows for a lifetime in their astronauts in just the eight months of travel. And, and on the surface of, of Mars, it, it, it's, it's every couple of weeks, it was getting another lifetime dose of radiation that NASA allows for their current astronaut. So you can see that within a couple of months on Mars, um, we would be at, at a far greater risk than uh, of radiation, dying from radiation than would um, someone would on the Earth. Um, and it, NASA's limits, by the way, are, uh, you know, it's not just cancer that's going to kill you from radiation. It's it's the other stuff, the free radical damage that that this kind of cancer can cause, so that you're more likely to die of liver failure or kidney failure than than you would be. You'd be almost lucky to die a few months later from cancer. Okay, and there's several types of radiation. I don't need to go into those here, but it's um. You know, the Hulk was supposedly belted by gamma rays, and that's how he got so big. But it's likely that if he was hit by gamma rays, he'd be whimpering and, and crying in the corner, be, you know, a couple of hours before he died uh, from gamma radiation, which is, is pretty serious. It can go through lead. But they didn't know that at the time, and it kind of makes for a good movie. Uh, but the, the effects of, of radiation are, are kind of hit and miss. You never really know whether it's going to pass harmlessly through you or whether it's going to pass harmless or through your genome and, and damage some of the cells, which could be um, create um, some kind of uh, mutant effect on, on your cells, uh, also causing cancer or, or, or preventing or causing the oxidative stress that we see from, uh, uh, from um, if it hit, say, the mitochondria or something else, we get these oxidative stresses that are typically a sign of aging, such as these spots here. This pigmentation is a result of um, free radical damage to our skin. And uh, it's kind of like, think of it as rust, I guess, um, uh, oxidative damage. This is why we take free radicals, scavengers, um, uh, to in our diets, why we need them so that our body can, can attend to the uh, the free radical damage that occurs all the time. Uh, and we already know a lot about, um, you guys do, what free radicals do and how they, um, what damage they can cause. Uh, we get the, the damage from smoking or radiation, or metabolic, just simply metabolic damage as a result of, of being, uh, depending on oxidative metabolism. Um, okay. And as I mentioned, it's likely that the effects of Scott Kelly's cognitive effects were, are more likely due to uh, radiation damage, such, such as they demonstrated with uh, this group of rats exposed to a certain amount of grays of radiation um, uh, compared to what they were at zero grays. Um, you can see that there's a tremendous loss of, of some of the sprouting ability of these neurons. Okay, and I think I mentioned the um, uh, the, the, the NASA lifetime dose is, is, is um, uh, a thousand millisieverts or one sievert, which is the way NASA likes to measure. And then probably the best way to measure radiation is in sieverts, how, how much penetrative power it has. Um, and you can see that the, the 180 day transit to Mars produced about this, this many millisieverts, very close. 
And that 500 days on Mars produces well beyond what the um, lifetime dose of radiation that NASA allows its astronauts. Um, and that's only 500 days. So uh, we don't know a lot about what kind of radiation effects are going to be on, on creatures in Mars. We haven't sent any creatures to Mars yet, but it's certainly not likely to be good. So, and as I mentioned, the da danger isn't from cancer, the danger is from free radical damage to your other organs that's, that's going to probably do you in before you get there. Uh, then microgravity is the other big danger. The fact that we're floating in a um, in a 3D world and not having much of the ability to to uh, that we do that we were we evolved to on Earth to experience. So uh, our bone and muscles depend on that kind of contact with the Earth, um, and we that we don't have. We'll see lots of um, lots of problems that happen. That there's a lot of bone and muscle loss, and that leads to a lot of calcium in the bloodstream that really terrifies NASA that there would be some kidney stones. Um, and you know how painful that might be to an astronaut um, without the resources that they would have at home on the earth. Um, there's a cephalid fluid shift I've already mentioned with space anemia that we'll see more uh, how that can hurt us and, and, and the choroidal infolding, the, the enfolding or folding up of the, of the choroid, which is the back end of the epithelium. In the eyeball. And then there's always the dangers we don't know about because we haven't sent anybody to Mars yet or in, in space for that long a period of time. They've been in near Earth orbit, sure, but they've been protected by the Van Allen belts and, and um, probably not getting too much in the way of solar radiation. Um, but hey, there's also always a chance of a coronal, um, um, a burst of energy from the sun. Uh, the cephalid fluid shift is this, the, the tendency of, of your extracellular fluid to migrate towards the head region. You can see this large swelling that we have up here. And because it doesn't require much effort, as much effort on, as on the earth to pump, the heart shrinks a bit. Uh, but it, it sends an awful lot of, of blood flowing towards the head region so that your face gets a little puffy, your peripheral, your fingertips and legs lose a lot of fluid so they're getting more spindly looking, but this is this is what happens. But it also has consequences for uh, a, a lot of physiological processes. For instance, that the the baroreceptors at the aortic arch are are tricked into thinking that there's a lot more fluid volume. There's a lot more blood the, the, the signaling a blood pressure rise, um, and and maybe dangerous hypertension. So it's it actually sends a, a hormone to the kidneys to start absorbing more fluid. The quickest way to get rid of um, uh, an increased fluid volume that it senses is to, to pee it out. And so uh, that leads to the space anemia, it leads to dehydration because you're, you're always going to be in this, you got all this fluid up here, you're just not going to get rid of it by peeing. So you're going to be dehydrated as well as other stuff. And then of course, there's the eyeballs that, that, get, uh, that become enlarged slightly because of the fluid shift. And that can lead to a, almost a glaucoma-like setting situation where um, the, the pressure on the eyes is, is damaging to the to the to the um, rods and cones, creating a loss of sharp vision. Uh, so this this cephalid fluid shift is purely the result of of, of microgravity floating in, in microgravity. It causes lots of problems that probably we don't even realize yet. The astronauts that have landed on the Earth, many of them who experienced a loss of vision, uh, visual acuity, um, still have a, a blurrier vision than they had before. Same with Mark Kelly or Scott Kelly. Uh, here's the choroidal enfolding. Uh, you can see what this is what it looks like compared to um, uh, what it, they when they first experienced flight. What vision they had perfect vision. Um, and it's, NASA is still studying this and not really certain what's causing it, but um, uh, I think, and many of my friends think that it has a lot more to do with the choroidal enfolding, the fluid shift towards the head region than, um, than anything else. And that leads to the swelling of the optic disc, which pushes the, um, it's dangerous for the rods and the cones, just as glaucoma is, where the intraocular pressure builds up and crushes a lot of these rods and cones which by the way is the number one cause of blindness in people, glaucoma. Okay, and we've already mentioned that the heart shrinks a bit, it doesn't have to do so much work, uh, but when you land on the moon or land on Mars, you're gonna have to do a lot of work. 
And so it's going to take a while to get your heart back in shape and your muscles back in shape. And, and, and muscle atrophy is something that's really extraordinary. Um, something to the effect of 20% loss of muscle mass um, in, in, in five to 11 days. 20% loss from this to this. Um, you can imagine what a six to nine month trip to Mars, you, you probably would break your arms or, or, or get tendonitis from, from trying to open the hatch or climb down a ladder. It's probably, you know, it's not likely that it's going to continue at a 20% rate for 11 days. I don't see how it could. There must be some limit to, to that, but no one's been there, so we don't know. This is the, the size of the Orion capsule that they're hoping to send to Mars. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, where are you going to be doing your exercises here? Um, so to, in order to counter this muscle loss, they have to do two, at least two and a half hours every day of high intensity exercising uh, in order to protect themselves somewhat, uh, but it's not gonna be possible in, in, in the Orion. Perhaps the Orion is linked to gateway as we saw, but even then it's gonna be a small space. I hope I'm not being too dismal for you that, that this is what they have to look forward to, but these are the things that you have to solve before you can go into space, at least safely, unless you take the Elon Musk approach that, well, you know, we'll throw a hundred people at a time up there and. Maybe 10% will get there. That's that that'll be enough for a while. Um, and then there's bone demineralization, the, the loss of calcium from the bone, where you have this beautiful balance of osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Uh, we'll see that that's um, that's lost uh, as we go into space. The the, the 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 osteoclasts are actually more in, in force, and we're losing more bone than we we do on the Earth. And what NASA, the same solution that they use for muscle loss is, is to bungee you to a, a treadmill and keep you, keep you jogging as much as you can for that two and a half hours, but you're not making the contact that you would on earth if you were jogging. So you've lost that piezoelectric property of the benefit that, that we get from um, running on, on the earth to stimulate bone growth, to stimulate those osteoblasts. And so it's not likely that not only are you going to be unable to open the door, you're going to break the bone because it's been so become so brittle from uh, loss of uh, loss of calcium. Uh, oh, I don't. I didn't mean to leave this one in, but we all know Giorgio thinks what the uh, that that uh, asteroid from outside of our solar system was, um, and it's just uh, something that I, I meant to show to my other my class tomorrow, but. Uh, this is, we're getting into what the Fermi paradox was, which is basically Fermi said that um, if, if the, you know, the Drake equation says that there's so many possible planets, then where are they? It's a paradox that they're not here yet. Um, but, you know, you have to consider that the Drake equation has ebbed and flowed with lots of civilizations and, and then few civilizations. Um, they've, they've corrected it or tried to correct it, but we just don't know how many civilizations reached a point that uh, where they killed each other off or, or um, never really, it was more efficient being hunter gatherers, but I don't wanna dwell on this. And then the countermeasures, quickly go through those. Um, and and a, a colleague of mine has, has come up with, a, I think a tremendous idea is to ride asteroids to different planets, to use them as taxis to take us to, uh, they go a, a little bit faster than, than our, our rocket ships can take us there. But the, the, the important thing is that you, you could build kind of uh, uh, protective spaces, habitats under the, uh, under the surface of the, of the asteroid. And that would protect you from a lot of the solar radiation, certainly. And you would have a much greater room to, to, to exercise and to grow plants. And, and then when it came time to jump off on to, to catch the Mars Express, you'd only be a couple of uh, a week or so away. And I just think that's such a clever idea. Um, and by the way, the um, uh, another idea for these asteroids uh, that we might ha inhabit is is um, I just saw this. Uh, someone was talking about this on the internet uh, a while ago. That this might be a great way to send people into space just to explore space. People that would be willing to to spend ten years traveling our solar system by riding an asteroid. It would be a perfect perfectly good uh, habitat that we, we would develop, that they would be able to, to take measurements and explore the, the solar system by hurtling past 
uh, different planets, just like you would on an asteroid. And as you return to the Earth or got close enough to where you could jump off, it, it, it just seemed like a really great way to explore space, like, like a cruise liner that goes uh, through, through the solar system and then back again. Uh, but I like the idea of getting us to Mars more quickly and safely. Otherwise, the, the Planetary Society, of which Bill Nye, the science guy, is a, a, uh, the, the CEO of, of that, um, they're, they're really pushing hard for a, a light sail and have had two flown already in space and very, quite successfully to pick up solar wind, solar particles, those helium and hydrogen photons that, um, that would allow this thing to propel at near light speeds over time. We might be able to make it to Mars in a few weeks rather than a few months at that speed. Uh, by the way, I'm a proud member of the Planetary Society, which I hope you, you will too. Uh, radiation countermeasures uh, told that uh, graphite nanofibers, similar to what's in, in bulletproof vests that police use, is a very effective way to, to, to block some forms of solar radiation, not the other others, galactic radiation that we might experience. And there's an awful lot of talk about a mag an artificial magnetic field around an ast uh, a spaceship, such as the Enterprise shown here, that might be able to block a lot of the, you know, the particles. Uh, with a strong um, electromagnetic shield. Other than that, we just don't know. We might take um, uh, antioxidants, ra free radical um, uh, preventers, um, that that uh, such as heavy dose doses of fruits and vegetables, or we could push all that into some kind of pill. There is the the topic of hormesis, which is kind of interesting. How how, how much of of exposure to radiation? Um, in some cases, actually improves your resistance to radiation, but we don't know at what level that becomes protective and, and then when it becomes dangerous. But there's a the concept of hormesis that might protect us as well. NASA's solution to countermeasures is one I completely disagree with, is lower body negative pressure, where they put half of you inside an industrial strength vacuum cleaner and it sucks all your, keeps your fluid from migrating to your head by keeping it in your, in your lower regions. And it leads to all kinds of, you know, horrible, you can actually faint if the balance isn't just right. It sucks out too much. You get tremendous hickeys all over your legs. Um, and it's, it's, it can be kind of dangerous. And I don't know too many people who want to sit in a vacuum cleaner for a long time. There's also the short arm centrifuge that might, might make it if you had a big enough space, but it's only, for a couple of hours that you would be going at a, at a gravity that would produce uh, earth gravity equivalents. Um, and you'd have to do that for a long period of time. But then again, it might, it would certainly beat exercising, I think. Uh, so this is their idea for the cephalid fluid shift, um, and which isn't such a great idea at all. My solution, and, and one that uh, I, I've written several times to NASA about, is, this, is a, something like the advanced tactical anti-G suits that our fighter pilots wear. I worked for a while with the Air Force, as, as was mentioned, and, and this, um, this had been developed long before I got there, but the concept is pretty much the same, that um, when you make a high G turn, instead of the blood pooling in your feet, the, the, the puffs up, the air is used to puff up the, uh, the, the bladders in this outfit, keeping your blood from flowing completely to your, to your legs, keeping it in your head region so you don't lose consciousness. And with this device, people are able to pull 12 Gs. Without the device, it's not possible to experience a high-performance jet maneuver with, you know, where you're 12 times your body weight. And in space, you might just get an attractive wetsuit that people could wear that would act like a compression um, suit that would keep your, your fluid from migrating to the head region. This seems like a far better solution, certainly one worth a try than than the lower body negative pressure or the short arm centrifuge. I hope you agree. Uh, this is one that I'm still trying to get funding for. And I think I'm close. I've got a company in Israel that's interested in it, but um, uh, it has to do with a, a serotonin blocker that I tested for the Air Force uh, because of its anti-nausea effects, uh, particularly for radiation-induced nausea. It's, it's still the world's 25 years later it's still the world's best anti-nausea drug. Uh, the World Health Organization has said that every hot, every formulary in the, in the world needs, especially third world countries, where nausea from um, you know raw meats and other um, um, 
water, impure water that is still a big problem, this would be protected from that. But it, it's, it's its radiation effects that I like. You, you may not realize it, that, but most of the serotonin in your body is not in your brain, but in your gut. Uh, and these serotonin blockers work on, on the, that receptor site, one of the receptor sites, the 5-HT3, 5-hydroxytryptamine 3 receptor. But it certainly reduces gut serotonin, which is it's been discovered by others that um, uh, that gut serotonin. One of the purposes of gut serotonin is to reduce the amount of uh, of osteoblast activity. So if you're if you're constantly nauseous or periodically nauseous in space, you're going to be releasing a lot of of gut serotonin, which is going to be telling your osteoblast to stop working. That's going to cause your osteoclast to 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 start demineralizing bone and sending a lot of that into the into the bloodstream where it could cause kidney stones and other problems, hyperthyroidism or hyper calcium levels. Um, and in addition to that, the, uh, the serotonin released by the gut can also uh, produce a lot of melatonin. Melatonin is a metabolite of serotonin. So if you block serotonin, you're also blocking melatonin. Remember we talked about the sopite syndrome uh, that's uh, in space, why they're so sleepy. It may be because they're releasing so much gut serotonin that not only having an effect on their bones, but it's also affecting their, their fatigue levels, which by the production of uh, melatonin from uh, an overproduction of serotonin. And we find that once we have serotonin in the works um, and melatonin, both of those um, act in concert with the other hormones that regulate calcium, calcitonin, parathyroid hormone, um, and, 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 uh, have, and, and that's thrown out of whack when you've got uh, a lot of melatonin around. Here's a, for example, here's an x-ray of someone with a really exaggerated pineal gland, but you can see it's calcified because of all the melatonin it's been producing and thus all the, uh, the calcium that's been extruded from that tissue um, as it's in the process of making converting serotonin into melatonin. This is a, 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 a large example, but um, uh, I, I know from radiologists I've spoken with that it's a tremendous marker for them in a 40, 50 year old individual to see that, that calcium um, um, uh, opaqueness um, on their pineal gland and that lets them know exactly where other markers are, where they need to go so many millimeters from, from the pineal gland. So it's pretty good evidence that, that the pineal is producing a lot of melatonin, but it's also producing a lot of extruded calcium, such as we might get from bone, um, right? And by the way, as I mentioned, uh, the effects on bone are pretty important. Um, uh, melatonin's effect and calcium, uh, serotonin's effect on bone. As, as evidence for that, we have things like um, uh, fluoxetine or, or uh, Prozac, which is a serotonin, uh, reuptake inhibitor, and its effect is to produce a lot more serotonin uh, in your body, all over your body. It's a tremendous uh, ser serotonin reuptake inhibitor, so you've got a lot more serotonin hanging around. And and they warn you in the package insert for, for fluoxetine that you, you've got to be more careful of brittle bones if you're on this product for long periods of time. So there's a lot of evidence that uh, if we block the serotonin from the gut with our, our uh, by the way, the drug that I tested for the Air Force for its anti-nausea effect um, was um, on Dancitron or, or Kytro. We also tested Granicitron. Those two are the um, primary um, serotonin blockers that we'd like to use in space. Uh, and that's going to, you block the serotonin, you're going to be blocking the production of melatonin, which is going to perhaps reduce the fatigue so pipe that the astronauts are still experiencing. And we might have also affect our bone and muscle loss. We know muscles certainly depend on calcium a lot for their, uh, for their activity. Maybe some of that atrophy from the muscles is due in part to their loss of, of, um, of calcium. And then we have our pineal effects. So it's not an unreasonable uh, uh, suggestion that, that blocking gut serotonin Something like 90% of your serotonin is in the gut. That's a considerable amount. And it has a lot to do with, here, here's a picture of, of um, the effects of, from the intestines, the uh, chromophin cells in the intestines that produce the serotonin. And they get into the platelets and that gets into blown, bone and blocking the receptor sites on the pre-osteoblast cells as a serotonin receptor. 
and that's going to inhibit the osteoblasts and allow the osteoclasts to go ahead and, and consume a lot of, uh, reabsorb a lot of bone. Uh, in the in the brainstem, we have our vomiting centers, and of course, we have um, a serotonin receptor that's uh, that that's also a part of that brainstem vomiting center. In the chemoreceptor trigger zone for emesis. <clears throat> okay, so the big countermeasures are um, uh, is 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 we need to get good at making biodomes on on asteroids, on the moon, on Mars. Um, and 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 include them underground so that they're protected more from the the ability of of the solar radiation. Um, and we need to have our moon base. That's where we got to go first, which I think NASA is doing. But as I said, they don't have a very good plan for uh, getting into anything beyond the moon right now. And they've only had this plan for Artemis in the last uh, five year, ten years. Um, before it was a really crazy asteroid redirect mission, but we won't go into that. Um, this is the, the best solution for um, uh, art, is artificial gravity for, for um, uh, the microgravity effects that we talked about, where we would, um, here's, here's Werner von Braun's, actually this is from 2001, a space odyssey. They got it right because they talked to Werner von Braun. Well, it's, it's amazing to me that we don't have this. We could spend years in space and instead of the few months that people could spend before they they had to be poured out of a space capsule but you would you would have hyper uh, normal gravity here on the periphery of the wheel and microgravity in the center of the wheel so you could do all the experiments you could do now but you you would have the added benefit of, of living in a normal gravity world and it's the way we have to get to mars it's the way we have to what we have to have in, in space this is what uh, von Braun's concept was actually before the space shuttle. See, there were all these, so many people would be living there and working there that they would have to have space shuttles to, to get rid of, to help them escape if they had to. And Elon Musk has a primitive idea of it, but I think a good one uh, for his mission to Mars, they would have two um, passenger compartments and a supply compartment that would be spinning on the way to Mars, giving, keeping these people in normal gravity. Um, and I hope this develops. It was, he posed it at 21 uh, but I'm not too sure how far it's gone. Okay, time for question and answers. I'm sorry I took a little bit longer than I thought, but uh, I just thought I'd propose a couple of things that you might want a little bit more detail on, but I'd be happy to entertain any questions you had about it. And if you have my email address and feel free to send me your thoughts. Thank you so much, John. That was an amazing talk. Really, really interesting. So, so many interesting ideas and so much fantastic research that's going on and it's always wonderful to hear about the research that you've been involved with and things you've developed and the things that you you have in the pipeline so um thank, thank you very much indeed for that so questions does anybody have a question if you'd like to ask a question was it clear what i was suggesting about serotonin um yeah i think it was really clear and so i have a it's a bit of a random question. Regarding bone, do you reckon you'd be able to like use micro impacts or like movements to try and stimulate osteoblasts a bit more because they use the fluid in the, yeah. Sure. Yeah, you, 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 but you know, how much would you, it, it'd be tough to, to get all the bones and, and to, to know exactly how much you need. It seems possible to me you could, you could do that with, with vibration, uh, but I, I'm not certain that anybody's worked out those details yet. I think artificial gravity is a much better solution for yeah. so many other reasons. And why don't we have artificial gravity anyway? Whose idea is this? What are they thinking? I had one more question. Do you know if there's been any research between uh, like use of Ondansetron and like roller coaster? Because oh, my mom was, and roller coasters, right? Because my mom was a nurse and she used to give me a dance to when I was a kid because I'd be vomiting all over the place from roller coasters. And it worked amazingly. Yeah. Oh. If, if you've got cancer, they'll be giving you on dance to prevent the, the, the radiation treatments from causing you to be have vomiting all the time. I had a friend of mine who just said, I don't need this. I'm not throwing it up and stopped taking her on dance to Within a few hours, she was just painfully vomiting and quickly went back on it. It's a tremendous medicine. I don't know why. They're not using it. Uh, they prefer um, for their anti-nausea drugs scopolamine patches and phenergan. And scopolamine is a tremendous has tremendous effects on skeletal muscle contraction. Your coordination is going to be off, and it's going to produce amnesia. And phenergan is a is a gigantic chill pill. It's a 
it's a major antipsychotic drug, a tranquilizer drug. So that's not something you want your astronauts to have either. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, push for, it's, it's up to you now. I've done all the pushing I can, and they're not listening to me. Uh, but, but push for artificial gravity and for uh, much better anti-nausea drugs in space. And uh, there's a good chance that, that we'll be able to get off this rock, or at least some of us. I think they should send older people like myself rather than younger people, you know, people who've already had a life. And it would be, uh, I'd certainly would go, but um, only if there was artificial gravity or, or uh, and, and on Dancetron on board. Thank yeah. you very much. And good luck to all of you, especially to you, Rowena. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank, thank you very much. If we can all please just, uh, just say a little thank you and uh, we really really appreciate you coming along today it's um it's always wonderful to hear your talk and always love you to to see you and i really especially appreciate you taking time out from your sunday afternoon to come along and talk to us i've enjoyed it immensely and any opportunity i have to talk about space uh, i like it thank you very much goodbye everybody good luck okay, thank bye. you thank you very much bye.